Oh, we're live. I was trying to adjust my computer. And I have a funny little echo. I'm sitting in this funny little spot in my house. Um, I realize that wants, needs, and desires are not necessarily all about love per se, but so much of that conversation um, does kind of revolve around and within and circulate in um, love and relationships and all these things. And so I, <laughs> it's actually funny if you could see me because this little altar that I have is kind of like in a transitionary spot in my house. So I'm sitting in this kind of very sp funny spot in my house. Um, but I wanted to be able to share this altar with you while, like to be with it, I guess, um, while I'm doing this live. So here you can see a little bit more of the whole thing. And uh, anyway, I was adjusting my computer and then I got surprised by going, I was like, oh, I'm live. So, um, so I'm in an awkward spot. So forgive me if it's just a teeny bit awkward. And hopefully someone would have let me know, hello, hello, if my sound is really odd here. I can hear this little echo, but maybe it's actually great acoustics for all of you. Uh, but just let me know. Let me know if it's super weird. And welcome. As always, a welcome, welcome. So before I really dive in, of course, I want to say to anyone watching live that I always love all your questions, all your comments, um, all your shares about how this either applies or doesn't apply to your life or an inquiry about how might this apply to this particular situation in my life. Um, so if you're live, you know, like absolutely, let's be in the dialogue. And if you're watching the replay, welcome and thanks for coming back and watching the replay. And I also love and welcome all your questions. Um, it's really nice when you say hi when you're watching the replay because I don't get to see who jumps on. But it also really helps if you do leave a question or a comment to give me a little context because I, I don't know what I'm talking about when you're commenting. So without further ado, I really want to dive into this topic of wants, needs, and desires. And specifically, I mean, I've done other lives and I have blog posts and, you know, maybe I'll put some of those links in the comments. But I've, I've actually talked a lot about wants, needs, and desires because uh, it's one of my favorite topics, both about what are the difference between wants, needs, and desires, how do we ask for them, um, how do we reveal them, in even nonverbal ways, you know, how do we set boundaries around them? Like these are all really interesting, juicy facets of the larger conversation of wants, needs, and desires. And as most of my, I think brilliant, we'll see. Anyway, as most of my ideas um, come to me this like I, I think I might have actually been toweling off because I didn't have any clothes. I was running and I went and I, you can see, these are my notes <laughs> for this live. But I was like wet and trying to get the kids ready for school. And I was like scribbling frantically these ideas um, because it really hit me. Often what will happen is there'll be these little niggling pieces and I'll be like, what? It's like, a, what is that? What is that? What is that? And then something will come, I'll be like, oh, that's what was like kind of rubbing like sandpaper or, you know, snapping in my ear that I just couldn't get rid of around this topic. And it really suddenly came to me, you know, and even though I, I actually teach a lot, especially with women, both in the realm of how to even discover what our wants, needs, and desires are. And then how do we communicate them in a way that has somebody want to meet us or meet those needs? And I also do a lot around how do we fulfill ourselves? So that's a whole other body of work. But what I want to talk about now is this kind of insidious and pervading assumption um, or like a fallacy. It's an assumption. And I would say, I would say it's a fallacy that basically then colors all of our other work around wants, needs, and desires. And it is um, captured both in this idea of like, 
you know, I need a man or I need a woman or I need a partner to meet my needs or I need um, even this, this conversation, I did a whole piece on being met in relationships, this idea of like, but they're not meeting me. Um, or then kind of on the other side, which a lot of us are very aware of is then the place of like, you know, I don't need anyone to meet my own needs. Like I know how to meet my own needs. Um, you, you need to learn how to meet your own needs. Uh, so that you're not dependent on a man or a woman or whatever, like all those variations, right? They like, you might disagree with that, right? I say like, but I need a man to meet my needs. And then the whole team of people would swoop in and be like, you don't need a man to meet your needs. You need to learn how to meet your own needs. And what I realized is that caught up in both of those ideas is the idea or the assumption, it's the assumption that our needs need to be met. And really there's like a parentheses after that. It's like our needs need to be met in order for us to feel happy or in order for us to feel good or in order for us to lead a satisfying, fulfilled life. And of course, I have to put my little asterisk like caveat here. I'm not talking about food, water, shelter, um, you know, basic love and touch needs, especially as a child. Um, I'm not talking, you know, I'm not talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs in terms of like the baseline needs that we need to live. But I am talking about like how we, how our needs will be met or how we feel loved or how, you know, um, I mean, and I'm also not necessarily going up to the realm of like people who think they need a six bedroom house or a hundred pairs of shoes and sort of, we can all go like, oh yeah, you don't really need that. I am, I'm even talking just in the realm of like, well, we're all like, oh yeah, that's a valid need. That is a, you know, that's a valid need, but there is this, I, I think it's insidious and pervading assumption that is also a fallacy, which is that we need our needs to be met. And that leads us to either someone else needs to meet them or I need to meet them. Or that uh, just that, that we, that's where we go, that we go like either I need a partner to meet my needs or I need, you know, the people in my life, even these idea of like, well, we can't just depend on one person in our life to meet our needs still has smuggled into it this assumption and this fallacy that our needs need to be met in order for us to be satisfied, fulfilled, happy, functional human beings. So again, of course, like just ongoing chronic abuse or ongoing chronic neglect or on, you know, like these are things to be addressed. And, and there is truly something deep, powerful and meaningful in sitting with this like, the that we believe our needs need to be met in order to be happy and that way we sort of abdicate not just even the responsibility but our um our capacity to be fulfilled to be satisfied to enjoy life when our needs aren't being met when they're not being met the way we want them to when you know all the different ways we do that are sort of like, but I don't know what I want, so I can't be happy. I don't know what I want, so I can't ask for it, and therefore I can't be happy. And like, I can't ask, I can't um, articulate it, which means they can't meet it, which means I can't be satisfied. And it's all predicated on this idea that our needs need to be met, <laughs> fulfilled, in order for us to feel met by life in order for us to feel fulfilled in life, in order for us to lead um, really deeply satisfying lives. And perhaps this is simply from my, you know, basic Buddhist upbringing, that there's some part of me that's like, no, no, that's not true. This is a false assumption that then so many other bodies of work are based upon that we get way, way out here and we wonder like why this isn't working or why this isn't working or why do I still feel unsatisfied in some way or I learned all the communication tips and, and it's like it's because deep, 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 deep down here at the bottom, they are built on what is a fundamental lie 
which is that in order to feel satisfied, in order to feel successful, in order to feel fulfilled, in order to love our lives, our needs need to be met. And I do, I believe this is not true. <laughs> and so, um, there's a couple of pieces here. One of the, I have spoken about this before, but one of the things that this leads to is that we pretend we don't need or want what we need or want when we think it will not be fulfilled. Because having a need or a want or a desire or like something we want in relationship or uh, a lifestyle, something like having something we want that may never be met is seen as the end all be all like worst thing in life. And it, it sneaks in again, I'm not opposed to any of these other teachings and I teach them. And, and even in the realm of like, I'm certainly not opposed to the idea of, um, you know, dreaming bigger than you think is possible or all these things. And there's, there's still, they, these can live side by side. So the idea, but would it also be okay if I was like, I want this thing and I may not ever get it. So even a lot of the teachings, so a lot of the relational teachings absolutely are predicated on that our needs should be met. They need to be met in order for the relationship to be good, for us to be satisfied, etc. But also life. It's like we, it's like we look at this idea that if somebody has a want and they don't think it can be met, that they have limiting beliefs. And maybe that's true, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's just like, you know what? I want, like, I want like a six bedroom house, you know, like in two months. And I probably can't have it, but I can want it. And this is the place where, this is part of where I think that this comes from is that we are so afraid of feeling, like the feeling of what it feels like to want without having. And so again, these teachings where we go like, well, here's how you ask for your needs to be met so that you're more likely to get it. Or here's how you handle your own needs so that you're not dependent on another to get them met. Like all of those basically are about how can you get that need handled so you don't have to feel what it feels like to want it? Like, let's just handle that wanting just as fast as we can, one way or the other. You know, let's, let's handle those limiting beliefs so that you can have it. Basically, so that you don't have to sit in what might be uncomfortable or might just be intense. Like the feeling of wanting. What is it like to simply want what you want whether you will ever get it or not. And I mean that both in the material world, like in kind of the lifestyle world, and in the relational realm. Um, what if you want something and it may or may never be met? Are you willing to feel what it feels like to want it anyway? And so most of us, and what I see, what most people do there's a couple of different things. And one is either to find a way to get that need met, like to, to meet that need themselves, to find a way for someone else to meet it, or to make it so they don't want it anymore. <laughs> and in some way, I think that is the most insidious. And it happens so often. Is this like, but if it's never gonna be met, why should I want it? It's like, but why not? You, you do. And so mostly I believe that that is a false sense of security in the sense of like, I can change, like mostly, I mean, I think our wants and desires and needs do change over time, but most of that I don't think comes from our conscious intending that it be so. I believe those things change by honoring and being honest about what they are. And I don't, I don't, I mean, I do mean with other people, but I mean first and foremost with ourselves to say like, wow, I want this and it hurts that I don't have it or it's scary to want it because I might never get it. Or, uh, you know, certainly all the like somebody might judge me or these, but like fundamentally just us with us so much of the time where I find that people stop themselves 
is because they're afraid to feel what it feels like to want something that they may or may not ever get. And just lost my train of thought. <laughs> and then, so what that is, again, rather than truly changing our desires, what I see most often is that people mask them and that it's actually a pretend. I will pretend to myself, yes, to other people. I know that that happens. That's sort of another set of things. But first and foremost, we pretend to ourselves. I will pretend to myself that I don't want it. But I would say, I would say 100% of the time, but all, you know, like never say never, never say always. So let's say 99% of the time in all the work that I have done with men, with women, with couples, like across the board, that when we really dig in, what I have found is that people do still want it. They just don't want to want it if they think they can't have it. And so it's, it's a lie. It's basically a lie we tell ourselves because we're unwilling to feel something. So I'm going to pause and just check the comments. Then I'll come back to my weird scattered notes with like arrows. And I'm like, this is cryptic. I can't even read my own handwriting. Um, hi, Dana. I love all your comments. And, um, and I'm glad that this resonates with you. Thank you. So Judith said, in my case, I just recognized the desire had to get met. So to make me feel okay, it, that it is okay to want it, like make it legit for me. It is not, it's not even about the having of the want of what I want, but just for the want to be okay that made me pushy for it or deny it. Okay, so I'm going to get into the pushy for it part and actually how it connects right back to this unwillingness to feel what it feels like to have a want that is not being met. And again, that can be in a whole lifetime. It may not be. We don't always know, but it also, the, like, it expands and it shrinks, and it's actually the same experience in the moment when we're like, my need's not getting met, my need's not getting met, my need's not getting met right now, and I don't like it. And that, then that expands into maybe it'll never get met. And then we, clunk, we try to pretend like we don't want it. So I'm not, there's a couple places where I got lost in there, Judith. I'm not an, entirely sure. But what I heard was needing to make it okay to want it. But that in order for it to be okay... I know I got a little lost there, so maybe you can say it differently, but something about the pushing or denying it. Um, so part of, part of why this is important, so what I do appreciate is what Kim, is part of why this is important, again, is this capacity to be with that we may have wants and desires and needs, again, not our basic needs for like safety and food and you know, stuff like that, but we may have wants and needs and desires that are never met or that are never met completely. In fact, that is guaranteed, but are never met in the way that we most perfectly want them by our partner or, or even by ourselves. Like we may never be fully met. And so our willingness and our capacity and actually building the capacity, the nervous system capacity, the patience, the, the capacity to be with ourselves feeling that, both as a physical, visceral sensation, the feelings, as an emotional experience, uh, being with the thoughts that happen inside of that, like literally being with the fullness of the experience, allows us, it, it actually allows for intimacy, because what it allows us to do is be with that feeling as we are with another person and not having our needs met in that moment when in all likelihood or probability they might be met the next moment or five minutes from now or a year if we're able to be with ourselves and with that other person in the experience of our needs not getting met but not pretending that we don't have them not pretending we're not having the experience that we're having of wanting something and not having it met so it's not like, well, I can sit here and 
you know, quote unquote, be with you, but not actually be here because I'm pretending that I don't want you to move closer. I'm pretending that I don't want you to tell me you love me. I'm pretending I don't want you to ask me to move in with you. I'm pretending, it's not about pretending, but actually be willing to be with the human we are as we want something, as it's not getting met. And that not only is that intimacy with ourselves, but it literally allows for intimacy with another human. Because let's face it, I don't know, I can't put a percentage on it, but a lot of the time, a lot of the time that we're with other humans, our needs aren't getting met exactly the way we want them to. And we deal with that by meeting them ourselves and by like sort of morphing our wants and needs and, you know, all these different things that we do just so we can like get through the day rather than like, oh gosh, this like how I would... Or we think we have to have it exactly the way we want it, right? Like things aren't exactly the way I want it. You know, I'm going to throw a fit in, you know, Whole Foods because they're not, they don't stock the thing I want anymore. Or I'm going to, you know, demand this, that, or the other because I deserve it. But all of that really comes down to my lack of capacity to be with myself wanting something while I'm not getting it. And again, I'm just, I want to make these like brief caveats because they're important, but I don't want to go totally down this rabbit hole, which is like, of course, if you're in an intimate relationship where like most of your needs are not getting met most of the time, like something needs to change. But I'm talking about a capacity within ourselves to continue to want and desire and to have needs even when they're not getting met either by another or even by ourselves, like to actually honor and to, and to dig underneath this assumption and this fallacy that our needs need to be met in order for us to feel fulfilled, in order for us to be satisfied, in order for us to have like happy, delicious, joyful lives. And it's just not true. It's just not true. So the piece that I want to come back to about what Judith said, and again, I'm actually not sure if I'm understanding your comment exactly, but the like getting um, pushy or pulley, <laughs> like she's saying pushy for the need, but also a lot of times people experience it like a pull, like you need to give me what I need. And I want to speak actually to this. Where did I write it down? Oh, right. So we all know. I mean, we all know this isn't true, but we also all know that being needy is like the worst thing ever. Like no one wants to be needy. Even if we like now there's like a shit ton of work out there about, you know, having needs doesn't make you needy, which basically just underscores that being needy is somehow the worst thing ever. Um, <laughs> it's just okay to have needs, but not to be needy, you know, but and then there's like a whole bunch, anyway, there's like a lot of work around where we can go like, it's okay to be needy or it's okay to want what I want or da, 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 these sort of things. But we all also know like nobody wants to be needy. So the thing is that the actual desire, like in a way, the actual neediness of I want this, I desire this, I need this in a relationship, I actually need it. Even like honestly, I need this from you is it is sexy it is attractive the actual place of wanting desiring having a need is attractive it is sexy the demand that you meet this need exactly the way i want in the time frame that i want it met so that I don't have to feel what it feels like to not get my needs met, that is unattractive. The actual like, you know, I mean, I would say, so talking about heterosexual relationships here, I'm sure that it translates, but I would say women, when you're into a man, doesn't it feel good to know that he wants you too? Like that he wants you as who you are, but also like maybe that he has a desire for you sexually, like his actual wanting of you feels good. It's attractive. It's a turn on. And I would say the same, like dudes, 
talking about heterosexual relationships here, but like when a woman is hot for you and she's like, please, I, you know, I want to have sex with you or I'm so attracted to you, like her desire in and of itself, sexy, attractive, like a turn on. Now on either side, honestly, right? We turn it on the, on the women's side, it becomes like, oh, she's so needy and clingy. And like on, you know, for women on looking at the dudes, it's like, oh my God, he's so like creepy and, and, and I don't know what the word is, but like, you know, demanding or, you know, we, we all know it's sort of, it's not okay for him to just demand sex. So, but on either side, basically our demand that you meet my need is the thing that's not attractive. It's the thing we call needy. Um, it, you know, we, or that we call demanding. That's the thing we call that. But what it is, is the demand that you meet my need the way I want it met in the time frame that I want it met. And again, comes right back down to what I talked about. The reason that we make those kind of demands is because we're afraid that the need won't get met, which ultimately, again, even deeper than that, is it, it comes down to our lack of capacity to be like to it reside in our own skin, in our own body, in our own being, in the experience of having a want, a need, a desire, and not having it met. And the capacity to stay with like, I want it, you know, I want you, I want that thing. I like I or even just even the vulnerability, like the tenderness of this is an, like, I have this need in relationship and what it feels like, how tender it is to have a need that may not be being met in the moment, but to still really recognize and honor, I have that need. Like those are attractive qualities. Those are sexy. Those are magnetic. As soon as we are afraid of our own wants, needs, and desires, as we're afraid of the intensity, or as we're afraid of not getting them met, as soon as we begin to reject them because we can't be with ourselves in the experience of having a want or a need or a desire that's not being met, then we begin to put a demand that you meet them. Or we go like, fine, I'll just meet that for myself. And those are not sexy, attractive, hot, magnetic qualities. But that's the demand. That is not the need, the want, the desire itself. It is not. So that that's that, that thing that you're talking to about getting pushy and pulley for it is ultimately it comes down to our own lack of capacity to be simply with the want, with the desire, with the need. Oh, thank you, Dana. So. I hope, Judith, maybe down lower you've added some comments that will clarify if I was way off the mark there. <laughs> I'm sorry if I was. Um, oh, thank you, Shannon. I hope you, maybe you could tell me again, what was the last thing I said when you made this comment? <laughs> I get a little in my own zone. Um, loving the part of myself that wants what I want. Yeah, whether it's met or not. So often the teaching goes to, if I love the part of myself that wants it, then I can give it to myself, which again, you absolutely can. And a lot of that comes from, I don't want to just want it. Like that's too anxiety provoking, or that's too intense in some way, shape or form to just want it. Like to literally be in the wanting, to be in the desire little side note before I go down lower, but you know, in a lot of the workshops that I teach, one of the things that we'll do is after people do very intense practice with each other, again, whether it's um, same sex or co-ed, but we'll say, you know, offer a bow or a nod or some silent gesture, but not to hug. Because a lot of times what happens is in those dynamics, a lot of um, send a lot of desire, a lot of attraction, again, sexual or otherwise, depending on the context, but gets created in intense practice. And this is true in life as well. Very few people ever play in the realm of feeling their desire for each other and not acting upon it. So in these workshop settings, like a lot of desire gets created or just attraction or like intimacy, you know, between two women or, you know, two men, but it's not necessarily sexual. And they'll want to hug or they'll want to, and it's basically to diffuse the intensity of that feeling. 
And so not only in those circumstances, will I say like no hugging yet, or like, don't, don't allow each other to just fall into each other. That's habit. But also when I work with couples, or if I work with individuals around sexuality, relationship, and intimacy, one of the things that I'll often talk about is really working with that space where the, the desire isn't dissipated. And one of the ways we dissipate desire is by fulfilling it. We're like, well, I'll get my need met and then I won't have to feel the desire. And that's a lot of what happens sexually, you know, just to take it into a real minutia, but it's like, oh my God, I want you so much. I can't stand like not having you inside me or not being inside you, or I can't like, because I need to dissipate how intense this desire is. I am not saying don't ever have sex or penetration or don't ever calm. You know, those are all great things, but bring consciousness to it. And your intimacy can become much wider in that space. And certainly your actual sex and your actual lovemaking with a partner or with yourself can become much wider and richer and like ultimately hotter because you're not just like, okay, how can I get off the fastest? Or how can I kind of like get over how intense this desire is? Because you can be with it. You learn how to actually expand your capacity to be with the wanting itself and find like how delicious wanting is. Having a need, having a desire versus having it fulfilled. Um, so Judah said, it's not about having it. It's about it being okay to want it, but I could not make myself feel okay about it. Exactly. I mean, I think in some way you're confirming the entire point of this. Um, I could not make myself, I had to be confirmed by someone else for me to feel okay about it. So then we get pushy and pulley about like, well, you, you know, you have to tell me either this is okay to want or you have to fulfill it, which shows me that it's okay to want it. So in a way, it, that exactly, like you're giving your, your unique experience of not be, basically not having the capacity inside yourself to be with that you want, like that experience being too intense. And then a way to dissipate it is to go like, you need to make this okay. Like, please give me what I want. And then, you know, they either reject or fulfill. And then that, you know, does something to our own experience. <laughs> so, um, so I see, yeah. So Judith said, but now seeing that I have the capacity to make it legit for myself. Absolutely. I love that. I love that so much. Um, <laughs> So let's see, Gina said, what if you are with someone who desires you and after exploring it, what is coming up is that what you want is just not there with that person. Feels kind of weird to want something and not acknowledge out loud that it may not be with the guy you're on a date with. Well, I would say, so this is kind of going on a tangent here, but I would say it really depends on the level of date you're on. You know, if you're on a first date with someone and you realize like they're not the person for you, I mean, I don't know, you can tell them like, hey, it just seemed, but, but I think also you can just say like, like, hey, that was really, really fantastic. Like, I wish you all the best in dating, you know? And then if you've been dating someone for six months, I mean, again, I could deal with this in like a lot of different scenarios. One is that we may not have brought our desire as fully as we could have. Like there's a lot, I see this all the time where we actually decide fairly quickly, this person can or cannot give me what I want, which again is a completely legit piece. And I'm not saying go have a relationship with someone who can't fulfill you. However, that still comes down to this place of, am I willing to, to want something even if it's not being met? And actually to keep like, like, oh, I want it, I want it, I want it. And what I have found, I mean, I have found this in relationships and I have found it with people that come and do the work that I do over and over is that when we actually um, not just talk, rah, 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 I want longer sex. Um, but when we reveal with our whole body and being like the depth of our longing without demanding that they meet it, a lot of times what happens is it does get met. 
But again, like brief answer to your question, you know, it really depends. Like, do you need to tell him what you want and that it's not being met? Or you just say, you know, great first date. Like, I wish you best luck and then go find someone else. That's a completely, uh, you can totally do that too. <laughs> Um, and, but if you're in a long-term relationship and it seems like they can't meet it, you know, then it, then it becomes a choice. Like ultimately you devote yourself to the relationship you're in, or you work out ways to, you know, I mean, again, this is kind of the work is like, I do a lot of work with people around, well, how do you get your needs met without demanding this person need it in exactly the way I want. But I also really want to open up like, yeah, and all your needs don't have to get met not just don't have to get met by him, but don't have to get met. So ultimately, whether you tell him what it is you're wanting or not also depends on whether you want to include him in that conversation. Does he know that that's what you want? Does he know how he could meet it? You know, or are you withholding that information from him? Uh, Judith, maybe? I hope I said that right and didn't butcher it. Um, she said, this is great. Thank you. I love how you make the distinction between the need and the demand. Uh, I definitely have to do more practice. All of us do. I mean, this is lifetime. This is a lifetime. And especially because culturally, this, this assumption, because it's not just, it's not just an assumption in the mainstream society, it, it permeates like everywhere. It's in the personal growth world where we're all like, you know, how to get your needs met outside your relationship or how to meet your own needs or how to like where, but it, all of that is predicated on, that all your needs need to be met in order for you to be happy. So there's just work to be done there on like, can I feel it? Can I just feel the wanting? Can I feel the need? Can I feel the desire? Can I feel it first? Can I build that capacity to feel and express and have that within my own self? So let's see, I'm trying to find, oh my goodness, there's so many comments. I may not make it through all the way until, oh good, I did, okay. Um, before the end, I wanna check my notes here because I had a few things I really wanted to say. <laughs> my notes are such a mess. Actually, looks like I got to everything. So, um, hmm. Thank you for being with me. Again, it's always really, really wonderful when to be with some of you here live because I very much enjoy that kind of interaction. Um, but I also very much appreciate people who come back and watch the replay and I love continuing the dialogue there. So, you know, please continue to share and express and be part of the conversation. And the fundamental, I guess I want to just make it really clear that I'm not necessarily implying that you should not get your needs met, but that there is a, um, like a truly incredible expanse, like a, it's like a, like a wellspring of life that is available when we are willing to feel our own wanting and desire without trying to fulfill it. Either get it fulfilled by another or trying to fulfill it ourselves. Like basically without buying into this assumption and this fallacy that our need needs to be met in order for us to feel good, to feel fulfilled, to feel happy, to feel sad, even to feel satisfied. Like how satisfying can it be truly to sit in our own longing, our own wanting. So that's my, that's my true wish and invitation around this. And um, from, you know, my love altar to yours, um, just sending you lots of love. Ciao.